What's up, everybody? Welcome to SWAT MMA, where we're smoking weed and we're talking mixed martial arts. This is episode number 137. I'm Jared, here with Paul. What up? Coming to you from the fight capital of the world, Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> Today, we're going to be smoking and talking all about the big BKFC 26 event, which sees their lightweight champion, Louis Palmino, <laughs> step up to the welterweight division to face off with champion Elvin Burrito. We're also going to be discussing the state of boxing's light heavyweight division and the possible unification of all four belts. Later in the show, we're going to be joined by pro fighter Katharina Lehner. Before we get into the combat sports, though, you know what time it is. Grab your weed, fire it up, and let's get into the weed of the week. Smoke weed every day. Oh, man, I totally forgot what it is already, Paul. Yeah, so uh, today bring we got today? some cherry cheesecake, over a mojo over at Wallflower. That's their uh, house tra- house brand. Cherry cheesecake. Mm-hmm. This one's got a lot of different lineages here. So uh, this one uh, is a mixture of Granddaddy Purple and Blackberry Kush, which breaks down to Durban Poison and Starfighter, which then breaks down to Cherry Pie and Kimbo Kush, which then gives us cherry cheesecake. I like it. This is real smooth, man. Mm-hmm. It's a, yeah, it's definitely like a lighter strain. I feel like it's a, it's got a pretty solid uh, THC content. It's a twenty three percent, so nice little. Uh, like that's a, I feel like that's like the sweet spot. You know what I mean? I feel like when it's like over twenty five, I feel like it's them like, you know, add a bunch of bullshit yeah, on top for sure. of it. Whereas like when you get that that like twenty one to twenty. Seven ish, like you know, spot. That's that's where I feel like you get your best taste, and you still get a nice high off of it. Because like once you get past that, then you're just fucking blazed halfway through. <laughs> yeah, this is, and this you can tell this weed has been cured and dried nice for a change. Uh, we rolled these ourselves, but uh, it is dispensary weed. Yeah, and for once here, I'm not bitching about it. Also got some Georgia pie left over from last week. We're gonna hit in this little bong here. And, uh, man, we were going to smoke on some, what was this, Gas Monkey? <laughs> yeah, but I'm this, a dumbass. This resin sauce, but unfortunately the Puffco's dead. Huh? Yeah, I showed up with the Puffco, and guess what? It's dead. Dude, you know what I was tripping on when I was doing that intro? You know, it's been 137 episodes. Yeah, it's quite a few. That's a lot, man. Yeah. It's been fun. All these mofos are rocking with us. We all appreciate y'all as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, before we get to today's guest... Katharina Lehner, let's go ahead and talk about um, boxing for a minute. Then we'll do BKFC, and then Kath- Katharina will join us. Um, dude, the light heavyweight division is just suddenly on fire here lately. Yeah. We've got, we had the unification bout this past weekend, which saw um, Joe Smith go up against Beatra Beev himself, mm-hmm. and talk about an utter destruction. Yeah. I mean, my lord. Under two rounds, Smith, who had never been down, he's never been knocked down in his pro career or his amateur career, Mm -hmm. he's knocked down four times inside of two rounds facing Archer. Yeah. Better believe this is a freaking savage, honestly. Um, Dude's got a 100% finish rate in his career, undefeated. Uh, He's literally, over his career, averages over 50% landed punches as well, so it's... Yeah, he's a guy who's clearly known for his power. He's the only um, boxing champion in all of boxing that has a 100% finish rate. Mm -hmm. But what we're starting to see here is that his ring IQ is very underrated. Um, I mean, he is so precise. And this victory here, it was just an absolute demolition of a world champion, world-class fighter. It didn't even look like he belonged in in the ring with him. Uh, total landed punches through basically one and a half rounds, roughly, was 48 landed <coughs> for Better Beef, 11 for Smith. He, better Beef threw 102 punches in that short amount of time. Oh, dude, I love calling him Better Beef. I'm just gonna. I know. Going. I was just thinking Shit that because every time you text me about him, it's like, "Hey, dog, Better Beef is killing this guy." That's right. I was like, <laughs> "Oh, really?" <laughs> better Beef. Uh, I mean, he out jabbed him, 40, uh, 14 to four even though they threw roughly the same amount. I mean, he threw 39 jabs, and he lands 14, just under 50%. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like 36%. Uh, 
uh, to 12% for Smith. 34 power shots landed. 63 total. He's landed 54% of his power shots in there. I think that's ultimately like a lot of been the difference in a lot of his fights. Like uh, his ability to land those power shots, or it's it's just he's like you said he's in his cl- a class of his own right now. And like that's it's just, unbelievable. You yeah. look at him and he doesn't really look that physically imposing. He, I mean, he looks like a tough guy, and yes, he's muscular, but he's not like a hulking individual. Yeah. But the power that he delivers just crushes these guys. You could tell on Smith when he got in there and he got hit, he was surprised. I mean, even when fighters have their guard up, his punches, they're so powerful, they still Punch find through. their way through. Yeah. It's He's going to be a real handful here. I think um, you know the fight that everybody wants to see is going to be Dimitri Bivol versus Peter Better Beef. <laughs> for the uh, for the unification of all four belts here, but some things would have to happen first for us to get there. Uh, number one being there's a mandatory challenger for the WBO in uh, you know Anthony Yard mm-hmm. and Canelo, of course, having just been beaten by Bevel, is wanting to exercise his rematch clause after the Triple G fight. Yeah, so both of the Champs at 175, however, would prefer to just have a unification bout. So what do you think the chances of this actually happening before anything else? I mean, we could get some step-aside money. They could try to, for yard, they could try to squeeze it in, you know, before or immediately after the fucking Triple G fight. Honestly, uh, if you're Triple G, or not, sorry, not Triple G, but uh, if you're Canelo, wouldn't it be better for you to wait for there to be a unified champion and then fight the unified champion and beca- possibly become the unified light heavyweight champ in one fight rather than having to chase a bunch of contenders around with belts that you want to try to, you know, like I get like light heavyweight. It's not necessarily his like um, weight class or like what he's going to spend the rest of his career at. But if he does want to rematch uh, Bevel and, you know, why not wait for him to possibly be the unified champion of the world and then exercise that rematch clause because that just because like I would think that it would be null it, when Canelo were to step into the fight to fight Triple G, which would make more sense, you know. Like usually when you have those rematch clauses, they're immediate. You know, that's not really. This is like a weird situation. I feel because I, I don't yeah. really can't remember any kind of recent history where like the challenger took another fight and then exercised the rematch clause. You know what I mean? Like, because going into it, Bivol was the champ mm-hmm. and then beats Canelo. And usually when that happens, you know, you're off, off and gone, you know, but this situation's weird because we have a guy who lost that fight who then wants to exercise his rematch clause. And then also he has a fight in between that already scheduled on top of that. I think it's odd that he got a rematch clause anyways. I guess it's just because he's Canelo Alvarez. Of course, that's why. <laughs> but I don't find that second... I don't find a fight between them to be near as interesting. I don't really find the Triple G fight that interesting either. Um, yeah. I think that what you said is correct. However, you know we've got Triple G on September 17th, and it's possible, we don't know, that Canelo will go after the second fight on Cinco de Mayo weekend in 2023, being as he loves to fight on that weekend. Yeah, it's kind of his timetable. Yeah, which would unfortunately push this possible unification bout, I mean, to like fall of next year, which... Unless they did it right away, you know what I mean? Like, if Yard ends up getting his his mandatory, then we're screwed. But if we wait for Canelo till next May, it does give you a bit of a timetable to squeeze in the unification belt or the unification title fight, if Yard is going to step aside. You know what I mean? In a perfect world, that kind of makes sense, I would think, is Yard yeah, steps I mean, aside, they have the unification bout, and then whoever wins, I guess, fights Canelo in May. Because there's talk of October 29 in London as a possibility for the Yard fight. Now, why couldn't they just get Yard some step-aside money, do the unification bout at that same time, mm-hmm. October 29th, which would still line up with the Triple G Canelo fight being in September, it's not really going to change mm-hmm. a potential rematch or whatever you want to say for Canelo with whoever ultimately wins this fight. But then I just have to question, would Canelo want that smoke from fucking Better Beef? 
don't know. I mean, let's say he goes in there and knocks out Beevil, which is a solid possibility. Not a given, but it's a possibility. It's a possibility, yeah. I'm not sure, because here's the thing. Uh, I truly feel that Canelo, the more and more he moves up, he gets more and more reckless. Like, in that Beevil fight, I just felt like his defense was not what it was at middleweight. It wasn't what it was at, like, any other weight class he fought. You know what I mean? It was mm-hmm. it was more him trying to impose his will and knowing that he was at the, you know. We saw him just throw so many punches that didn't land that it was like seemed like he was trying to be the dog, and you can't really do that with guys that are bigger than you. You got to be more strategic. So I don't understand. I don't. I don't think he would want to fight someone like Better Beef because it's like that's just not. <laughs> Unless he fights a perfect fight, there's like. I just don't really see a path of victory for him after that B Wall fight. Like I don't either. Like get, don't get me wrong, Canelo Alvarez is literally one of the greatest boxers of all time. And is in a short list of, of those fighters as well. You know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, weight classes were made for a reason. Absolutely. You know, like you have to understand where things hit a wall. Like, yeah, a lot of the greats push through that wall and, you know, move into another stratosphere of greatness. And right. I and he could still do that. But I do think that he is hitting a wall, that, which isn't necessarily his fault, but it's just well, size too big. Matters, but, yeah, so size is everything that sometimes. Matters. And that's also what is at play for better beef, because he turns 38 next January. He is mm-hmm. getting at the end of his career as well, even though he hasn't had the number of fights that a lot of these other guys have had. Yeah. At some point, age is going to be a factor for him, too. And mm-hmm. I think he deserves to have a big fight here to see you know, what's possible. Yeah. And the more and more of these four belt champions we can get in this modern era, because he's also the lineal champ, it would be a tremendous unification. That's mm-hmm. always good for boxing, even if it doesn't hold, it doesn't stick. At some point, to have had one in the new era, I think is important. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing too is not that I'm saying that uh, it's I don't know because both those are big for him though. You know what I'm saying? Like if, if better be if, like we're to get the the Canelo fight versus the unification fight. I think the Canelo fight is just as big as the unification fight. Yeah, I don't know how that would happen though, because I mean, what if he if beats Bivol in the in the unif- in the unification bout, and then he's like Canelo, I'll I'll give you a shot at the okay, title. Okay, yeah, I see what you're saying, yeah. yeah. So like, after he if he were to beat Bivol, yeah, like yeah, yeah, it's possible. I feel like the like you were saying if at his this point in his career, that's like best chance for him to make make his money on his way, you know, down the hill. Of course, one thing we are doing in this entire conversation is completely writing off people. Yeah, <laughs> no, we're completely writing off Triple G. I'm, I'm, I'll always write off Triple G in this situation, bro. He is past the fucking. He did not look good in hill. his last fight. <laughs> as on, far as uh, I mean, he gets the win, but I just don't see that fight this third time being any what even close to exci- as exciting as the first one or the second fight. True, but. I'd, Devil's advocate, he is a bit of a wild card here because if the unthinkable yeah, were to happen and he were to beat Canelo, I mean, all this this talk goes away with this third fight with, or second fight with Beevil and or whoever the lightweight champ mm-hmm. is, because that that would almost guarantee a fourth fight between the two of them. And at some point, the, the luster starts to, to wear off. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. That's, I don't want to see the third, but here we are. Well, that's kind of what we were talking about with the whole. Uh, uh, Fury and Wilder things like they could fight fucking hundred times like just because of all the mm-hmm. you know there there's just that's boxing sometimes you know what I mean think about how many times uh fucking Pacquiao rematched so many people four three four times like there's a lot of guy a lot of boxers like a lot of these boxers who have long running careers like a Canelo like a uh you know a Pacquiao people like that like they tend to run into a lot of the same names because mm-hmm. they're at the top of the top of the game for so long you know what i mean absolutely but um <laughs> yeah i just i don't see triple g having any kind of shot of beating Canelo. no i mean we'll see maybe we'll be shocked in september but we all kind of doubt it yeah unless that just like completely crippled Canelo mentally or something we'll, we'll see what happens if, if yard doesn't take any money or if maybe no one even tries to get it done we'll see what happens here uh but hopefully um everybody gets what's at 175 gets what they want which is an undisputed champion now, let's briefly, before we get into this really cool BKFC card, and before our guest joins us, let's talk about this past UFC event, the uh, the cat, um, the Emmett versus Catter. Yeah. I always say his name wrong. Qatar. 
don't know why. Uh, it's like an easy name. It's hard. What a fucking card. Holy shit. Tied, uh, either tied or beat the record for most finishes in a, inside of a UFC event, which is fucking ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, I had like seven KOs, one sub, and one decision, I do believe. Yeah, something like that. I feel bad for the person that got the one lone decision. Dude, that was a great fight, though, still. Even they that, didn't get the bonus. Only the only finishes yeah. got bonuses. But. Yeah, but that still was a fucking, it was a great fight. There was not a single fight on this card that was boring. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. <laughs> uh, <shit>. But, <laughs> but the, the card was good overall. Mm -hmm. uh, there was some controversy. That was what we're going to talk about in the main event because here we are on the theme again of judges. Mm -hmm. Controversy. You've got um, a split decision. It was close, but ultimately Josh Emmett gets the nod over Calvin. And I thought Josh won the fight myself. I wasn't really scoring it round to round this week. I was it was a hard one to score. Fight. I just afterwards, I thought, all right, I, th I think I think Josh Emmett took this. Mm -hmm. um, then afterwards, you know, you kind of look at the numbers. You can see the arguments for Calvin winning. I mean, he did outpunch yeah. him in three of the rounds if you're just looking at stats. But mm -hmm. like we always know, stats do not tell the complete story ever. Yeah, um, it was a strange fight. So if you really look at it, like the progression of how you, it even went round to round is interesting. So like in the first round, they didn't necessarily throw very many strikes at all. Like, it was a real feel, feeling out process between the two. Yeah, and, it was uh, like 14 to 11 on the strike count in the first round. And they weren't even really know. getting each other's range to begin with, too. It was a yeah. lot of feints, a lot of, you know, uh, feel, a, lot, a whole feel you out process. I think a lot of it comes down to the first round, at least mm -hmm. if you're just looking at it on paper. Yeah. Because if you look at the punch stats and overall stats the last two rounds, at least on paper, you can say go to Calvin. You can say the middle two rounds, you know, two and three go to Emmett. It's just round one where you've got 14 to 11 on the strike count. You've got this weird feeling out period. Yeah. Who do you think pulled that round off, I guess? Well, and the way it was explained on the broadcast, and for once and forever, I actually agreed with them. Uh, in that first round, I think all the, the criterias were even except for octagon control, and that's kind of what – the scoring system is supposed to be, you know, if you, if you look at striking, it's yeah. even grappling, it's even octagon control. And I felt like in that first round, Josh was pushing Calvin back toward, honestly, most of the fight. He was like, Calvin was in a real, uh, like he was fighting, you know, like a different way than what we normally see. And normally we see him drop a lot of like hard shots and try yeah. to put his opponents away. In this fight, I felt like he was just keeping Josh on the end of his punches, keeping that jab out there, using his range real well, and not uh, not that like um, he wasn't damaging Josh back, but I felt like a lot more of Josh's strikes were significant versus Calvin, who was keeping him at bay with the jab a lot throughout the fight. Even though Josh was bloodied up, yeah, I think he was landing the more powerful punches as yeah. well. Um, now, he calls for a title shot. Uh, against the winner of the Holloway Volkanovski, uh, that that makes the most sense. I would say next. Yeah, I think so too. We need new blood out there, anyways. Not only that, it's, everybody's tied up at the top mm -hmm. too. You got Volk and Max are one and two, and then you have Ortega fighting Yair, who's three and I think eight or something like that. So your your top three is is out. Cater was four. Emmett beats Cater. He's won what four or five in a row. Right. Right. So. Give him what he deserves. That's, that's, you know what I mean? That's the name of the game. Plus, I do think the stylistically, him and Volkanovski match up very well. Because they, I feel like they have both very similar style. Like, they're, they're going to walk you down, hit you with big shots, try to put you away, and they're well-rounded everywhere else to where they don't really have to worry about getting taken down or, mm -hmm. you know, being put in any kind of weird grappling situations because they're both solid grapplers. You know what I mean? Well, that's definitely a fight to keep an eye on because I mean, it's just coming up here in a couple of weeks, so we're going to dive into that more next week. But let's go ahead and talk about this upcoming BKFC 26, which is coming to us from Hollywood, Florida, which is headlined <laughs> by what is guaranteed to be an absolutely amazing banger of a fight because we have got BKFC's number one pound-for-pound pound fighter, Louis Palomino, 6-0, and 
lightweight champion, 155-pound champ. He's going up a weight class for a super fight against Elvin Brito, the current hundred or the current welterweight champion. <clears throat> We've also got number one contender bouts on here. We've got the return of Bet Wallings. We have got the debut of former <laughs> UFC fighter Jimmy Rivera. This shit looks absolutely sick. But to get started with, let's talk about the main event where we've got, you know, welterweight in BKFC is 165. So mm -hmm. um, there is that. So it's a 10-pound weight move up for Louis Palmino instead of like UFC where we get used to the 170 mm -hmm. and 155 uh, gap. Yeah. So he is 5-2. and two. In BKFC, he's actually got about an equal amount of experience. And, I mean, this dude is an absolute banger. He is coming off of a win over Caleb Harris at BKFC Jackson on January 29th of this year. Prior to that, he fought at BKFC 20, the big Bedford versus Barnett Jr., uh, where he beat Julio Garcia. And then he also has a win over Brad Kelly, uh, all coming within the past uh, two years. <clears throat> However... Louis Palomino is the number one ranked pound-for-pound -pound fighter in BKFC for a reason. What do you think of this matchup? For our MMA fans, this is the Louis Palomino from the WSOF uh, World Series of Fighting, of course now PFL. Uh, this dude has probably had the best transition, I would say, from MMA to success in bare knuckle. <clears throat> I mean, his record speaks for itself. Um, I mean, he's got I mean, the big win over that win. He's got wins over Tyler Goodjohn, over Jim Allers, Isaac Valley Flag. These are solid, like not just names that we know from both boxing and UFC, but these are solid fighters in bare knuckle as well. Yeah, what are you're your talking thoughts? about in that win, you're talking about a former champion. I mean, uh, you got a lot of guys who are pretty well known, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and Tyler cool. Goodjohn has got an amazing record over in Britain. Yeah. Jim Allers is one of the toughest guys in BKFC. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's. I mean, I believe that's who Connor Tierney's fighting. Yeah. on this card yeah. as well. You know yeah. what I mean? So, this is just an absolute banger, and the first time in BKFC we have a possibility for a champ champ. Double champ. Yeah, yeah, that'd be interesting. Well, and here's the thing: is overall, there's kind of a like a hierarchy. I feel like with uh, some of these guys who have come over from. Uh, mixed martial arts to the BKFC, and I feel like when we talk about someone like uh, Louis Palomino, I mean, he was in a kind of a weird spot when you talk about like MMA. You know what I mean? When mm -hmm. the WSOF, he was like, he was like one of those guys who had fought for the title, had one a crazy ridiculous fight with Justin Gaethje, almost beats him, loses, and then kind of got put in limbo. And now moving into BKFC, he's he's not only the champ, but now going for double champ status. Like, right. it seems like the transition has been seamless. I like him in this fight. I mean, I just don't see how you can pick against this guy in bare yeah. knuckle right now. He puts on just master classes right now. I mean, if you want a really good example of someone who has just got an amazing skill set for this, tune into this fight. It's, it's five bucks on the BKFC app, like we say yeah. all the time. One thing I do think could matter, but I don't. I don't necessarily know if it will. But uh, Brito is five years younger than than your boy Palomino, too. Yes, he is so a little he does bit have younger. A bit of, is a bit of bit of that youth aspect could, you know, be a difference. Well, let's talk a little bit about the co-main event, where we have got what is basically, I think, a, a, a the winner of this gets a title shot here. Mm -hmm. um, we have got. Yuli Diaz returning against um, Francisco Ricci. Francisco is ranked number three at middleweight. Yuli is ranked number one at middleweight. I, this guy's 4-0 and in BKFC. He's got wins over Jake Bostwick, Brian Maxwell, Noah Cutter. He's looked very strong in all of his fights as well. However, yeah. Diaz, I mean, this guy owns the fastest KO in all, all of combat, combat sports. Sport ever, yeah. So, this guaranteed to be a banger, too. What are your thoughts on this fight, Paul? Uh, and you got to remember, too, Yuli's coming down from light heavyweight, too. He yeah, was, he is the number he two ranked light, light heavyweight. heavyweight he well. fought for the light heavyweight title and lost to Thiago Alves. Yes, that and was his uh, 
yeah, he's he's come back since then and had a win at Knucklemania two over Sawyer DP, mm -hmm. uh, which that was a great fight. But yeah, he did lose that title shot to Tiago Alves, which is uh, no no slouch. No but slouch. My point being is there could be a, a definite size advantage for Yuli coming down from light heavyweight. Yeah, he is five foot ten. He's got a seventy one inch reach, whereas Richie is coming in. He's got a seventy nine inch reach and he's six foot three. Holy shit. Wow. He's big. He's way bigger weight. than I realized. Okay, oh so no, goodness. that that negates that. He's actually yeah. coming in with a size advantage. Mm -hmm. huh. Interesting. Holy shit, that dude is six three. Wow. <laughs> well, that's definitely one to keep an eye on. Yeah. I really feel the winner right here is gonna get another shot. Well, another if it's Diaz, but a title shot here. Now we've also got a very interesting women's bout here at uh, flyweight. We've got the return of Rowdy Beck Rawlings, who, you know, she's undefeated. She left as a champion, and then I believe she just had to give up her belts because she went back to MMA for a minute, yeah. took some time off. And she is coming in to fight Britain Hart Beltran, as she is going by, now recently married to the former heavyweight champ, Joey Beltran. Now, she is the number one ranked women's flyweight. She is coming off the loss to the current champ right mm -hmm. now, uh, who is Christina Fiera. Faria, sometimes I mispronounce her name. But Britain's got that great win over Pearl Gonzalez, which is really impressive. Of course, she's got wins over Jenny Savage, Randine Elkholm. This Paige is a Van big Zandt. fight for her. And, of course, the Paige Van Zant fight. Yeah. We can't forget that. Um, I think this fight boils down to how Beck, if she has any rust, ring rust here. I mean, is this a thing in BKFC? We Could don't be. really know yet. Could be. I don't know. Um, I think she, in my opinion, probably just comes back to the division, picks up where she left off. Beck's 5'6". She's got a 64-inch reach. I'm not sure if she has a size advantage here. Let's check and see. You know, and while I'm looking this up, i got to say kudos to BKFC. We used to talk a lot of shit about their website here on the podcast, and they seem to be putting this thriller money to fucking good use. Uh, they're about the same size, so mm -hmm. no difference there. Of course, now... Britain's got a lot more BKFC experience. She's four and three. She's got seven fights. Beck is undefeated, three and zero, oh, and she's been out for a minute. Yeah. I still got to go with Beck Rawlings here. Yeah, me too. I'm just, I'm a fan. She looked so strong in her previous outings here that I think, I think she comes back and and gets the victory. Yeah. And sets herself up for a shot at the belt that she never really lost, as far mm -hmm. as I understand it. She's the lineal champ. Absolutely. And then finally, uh, let's talk about one more fight on here because we have got former UFC, top UFC fighter, Jimmy Rivera, making his BKFC debut. Yeah. And he's coming in against no slouch. Um, he's fighting the number one ranked featherweight in BKFC. That's Howard Davis. And he might have his hands full here. Uh, Davis is 2-0. and oh. He's got wins over Josh Wright and Rusty Crowder. Uh, he's been doing one fight a year. He fought at BKFC Fort Lauderdale in 2022 and then on the Lombard versus Hunt card in November 2021. But one thing that really stood out for Jimmy in mixed martial arts was his boxing. This was a guy who had very quick hands. Trying so hard. Not what do you to, think? Not to put a dampering on this right now. You're not feeling him in BKFC? No. Because here's the problem. It's, it's not... Is it the Mendez fight that you're thinking in your head? The no. Mendez KO'd him? No. I'm just thinking about all the times he's been KO'd on the way out. And it's like, okay, so if you you got, you know, pretty much knocked out of the UFC, if you're really thinking about it, he was one of those guys who, like, was on the brink of a title shot, got denied, and then from there put on a lot of performances that made him seem like he was no longer the fighter he once was. Yeah, he fell off quick. I believe <clears throat> he was 19-0. Yeah, and, and then, then he lost his way out four of, of his last five or yeah. something like that. Five of his last six. But um, my point being is it's not that I don't think Jimmy Rivera can handle the technical aspects of the bare knuckle fighting championships. So I don't necessarily know if he can handle... Not unless, like, not the brutality, but I mean, just like the 
the possibility of getting knocked out constantly. And he's coming against a guy, look, two fights may not sound like much if you're not familiar with BKFC, but that's actually a whole lot more experience in a brand new sport than Jimmy has. And we've seen some athletes yeah. come over from mixed martial arts. Like we, we mentioned Pearl Gonzalez losing to Britton Hart earlier. However, she looked really good in that fight. Like mm-hmm. she clearly um, took to bare knuckle quite well. Mm-hmm. And then you have cases like Paige Van Zant where it just it didn't click. Yeah. So let's see what happens with Jimmy. You don't think he's going to make it, though. You think he gets knocked out? It's not that. It's just like it, you're going to come in and fight the number one featherweight in the world after yeah, losing yeah, four of your last five fights. Like, and, like it just doesn't make any sense to me. Like, not necessarily saying he's not going to have a good bare knuckle fighting career. I'm just saying I, I don't understand how he just gets the best of the best off the bat. Just, uh, what, if I was anyone else at featherweight, I'd be like, what the fuck? You know? Yeah, I feel you. But, you know, BKFC, for them, this was a big signing. So I get why they're, you know, putting him to the wolves right away. Yeah, no, I get that. But they did that with Paige Van Zandt. Look how that turned out. That doesn't always work. Like, I think you put it, like, similar. I know you kind of mentioned him before, but the, uh, Chad Mendez, like, Chad Mendez didn't come in and fight the number one guy in the world off the bat. And he was no, probably the most well equipped and ready to come in. You know what I mean? Correct. Like, Talking about a guy like Jimmy Rivera, who like wasn't it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows at the end of his UFC career. So like, yeah, maybe there isn't exactly the same strength of schedule, but you still got to give a lot of these guys the respect they deserve, and you you shouldn't be fighting the number one guy in like a title eliminator in your first fight in BKFC. I think. No, I agree. Well. There's a lot more to this card that we're not going to get into, but I would encourage everybody listening, and I know you feel the same, Paul, to check it out. Get the BKFC TV app. It's four ninety nine a month. You get the pay-per-views. You get their fight library. It's a, the best dollar twenty five you can spend a week if you're into fucking fighting at all. All right, now we've got a special guest joining us. All right, well, unfortunately, our guest, Katharina Lena, ran into some technical difficulties. We are unable to have her on the show this week, but we are looking to reschedule her before she hits that co-main event on Invicta on July 20th. So, Paul, we're going to switch topics away from the Invicta card, uh, and then we're going to talk about the PFL 4 that we just saw this past weekend, namely Jeremy Stevens, and then uh, a couple other subjects as well. So... Let's talk about Jeremy Stevens first. He squeaks out a split decision victory. Do you have any thoughts on the fight itself? I don't really care to have any thoughts about the fight itself. I can't, I can't get over it. He blatantly cheated in front of everybody, and everyone just kind of allowed it to happen. Let's talk about that. Uh, we're talking about the weigh-ins. You know, this is a big deal. And, and sometimes it's frustrating as fans of MMA and combat sports, Paul, and you being a former wrestler who – has had to cut weight multiple times in your life, Mm -hmm. competed in tournaments where you had to compete at a certain weight, correct? Yeah. I'm a former amateur boxer. I had the same thing. Fought Mm -hmm. in the Golden Gloves. You had to make weight. There's two jobs. One of Mm -hmm. them is making fucking weight. Yeah. So when a fighter cheats, clearly, to do that, it's it's a pretty big deal. Yeah, 100%. And it's frustrating when it gets blown over. Now let's talk specifics. Um, first, he missed weight for his 155-pound bout. He's moving back to 155 from featherweight, by the way. He, he misses weight, so he goes back. He shaves his head. He shaves his beard. He uh-huh. gets more time. He comes back out with the towel. He stands on the scale. He's still <coughs> off weight. He then clearly, there's photos on Instagram. Uh, everybody listening, let's give credit where credit is due. You can go to photo Amy, F-H-O-T-O-A-M-Y-33 on Instagram and see the photos for yourself. Paul and I have looked at them pretty extensively. It's clear he's cheating. His left foot, only the big toe, is on the scale. Uh, His four other toes and a good third of his foot on the left side is completely off the scale. And on the right foot, it looks like he is on the ball of his right toe only with the same thing, three to four toes off. And doesn't it look like his heel is also off the back of the scale right there? Yeah, cheating. Yeah, he's clearly cheating to make weight. He still just cracked 156, mm-hmm. and it's fucked up, and you have to call up. it what it is. Yeah, it is wrong in so many ways. 
and I don't understand how when there's clear evidence right here, this is undeniable photo evidence of a fighter cheating to make weight. How come nothing happens in retrospect? <clears throat> yeah, good point. How come the yeah. athletic commission is not fining him here? Seems like athletic commissions don't be, haven't been doing their job a lot lately. And I, I think that's part of a bigger problem, obviously, but it, it's getting out of control. Dude, absolutely. Rules matter. This is a fight that Jeremy Stevens winds up winning by split decision. And now the losing fighter is also faced with the fact that not only did he lose a highly contested, controversial bout, but he lost it to a fighter who cheated to get there in the first place. Because the fact is, this is a tournament. I was just going to say, even add a layer, another layer, he, he possibly could be out of the playoff now because the, there's only so many fights. You have, what, uh, you have three fights in the regular season. You have to at least win two of them. That puts that person in, in a hole already. Absolutely. It's completely, it's, it's more than just he loses a win bonus like a traditional fight. He just potentially could be cost a shot at a million dollars. Yeah. It's, maybe that's a stretch, maybe not. But what's not a stretch is that he cheated to make weight. Yeah. And Honestly, it's not a stretch because we've seen in, in these PFL tournaments, underdogs come out and, and win the win the million dollars. So, it's it's not about just like they say in football and any other sport that has like a format such as this. It's not about having, you know, it's not about being seventeen and zero and being the most dominant team in the regular season. It's about punching your ticket to the playoff. And when you punch your ticket to the playoff, anything can happen when you're there. And for a guy to get blatantly screwed in front of everybody and then lose a split decision to the same person he got screwed by. I just feel like that's wrong in so many ways. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's just disappointing, dude. Um, the PFL has the power to do something here, too. They likely won't. Yeah, no. Because they like to wash their hands and say that that's a commission issue. And I feel like <clears throat> the commissions like to just either ignore it because it makes them look bad, like fools, or they just don't give a shit, or they don't think it's like a big deal. Well, and then also... Uh, when you talk about the idea of Jeremy Stevens as a selling point versus, uh, see, I don't even know the guy you fought. Like, in all reality, I like, know I have it right dick, here, and it's funny because all the headlines. Because I mean, he loses and he gets screwed. But you know what I'm saying? Um, like at, at the end of the day, it, it helps the PFL that the Jeremy Stevens won. He's a, he's someone who has Miles Price household. is who he beat. Okay. Um, and it was Amy Kaplan here that got this photo. Uh, again, this photo, Amy 33. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know say I like Jeremy Stevens. I do but, too, but that's just dishonorable. And, and, and enough with this fucking shit where nobody holds anybody to any type of accountability mm -hmm. for any of this stuff. Like Daniel Cormier got away with cheating with his towel grab, and everybody knows it, and the UFC seems to like laugh about it. The commission doesn't do shit. It's just typical, mm -hmm. and it, it's a problem. Let's talk about this upcoming PFL. You know, I am interested because we've got the return of Anthony Pettis, mm -hmm. who, you know, he goes out and he loses his debut. Now he's come back in this tournament here and he's got a win, uh, a submission win, actually, six points in the tournament. And now he's mm -hmm. facing Stevie Ray. Uh, Another former UFC guy. In what I feel is a must-win situation. I feel every fight he's in, right now, unless he maybe makes it to the championship, is a must-win. Like, if he can't keep taking these losses in essentially a B-level, C-level league, whether well, or not that's accurate. Yeah, him and Rory perception. McDonald both are kind of in that spot where it's like both of them were brought in to be the faces, quote-unquote, of uh, PFL. Absolutely. And both of them have come in and flopped. You know? And that's the thing is when you have these high-profile guys who come in, just like in the same way I was talking about a little bit earlier in the show about uh, Jimmy Rivera. It's like the reason Pettis left the UFC wasn't because he was this high, highly touted free agent. Right. It, he was a bit over the hill and was sent down. So was Roy McDonald to a certain extent too. Um, so, like, although I agree with you, it's a must-win for him. but. I don't know how 
dominant he will be throughout the season is what I'm saying. I don't know either. But oh, we'll see what happens. Um, you know, we did have some breaking news here as we were recording or as we were starting the day as well We I wanted to touch on. Because there's not much too much else in that PFL card. I mean, Clay Calder winds up losing uh, in the main event. Now that's twice when he gets upset. Yeah. I mean, he's losing a lot of shine off him, too. He's lost now in boxing as well. He was on a little bit of a streak in boxing. I know it's not looking too good for Clay here. Mm-hmm. But uh, what about this uh, retirement of Eddie Wineland, finally? Yeah. I mean, good for him. Yeah, he needed to retire after that, man. Um, he was, He's been a great fighter. I always enjoy watching Eddie fight. He had, what, 50 fights? He did not enjoy watching the last fight. I mean, what was before that? Fucked up, man. Getting lit up. Mm-hmm. What? Hell. No. What? He was a WEC Phantom Weight champ. You know, he's 16 fights with the UFC. Yeah. Uh, he finishes his career 24-16-1. Uh, mm-hmm. he, uh, he challenged for the interim Phantom Weight title at UFC 165 in September of 23. That was when Hennon Barrow was defending his interim in that weird situation that was going on. He did lose that. Uh, but you're right. He captured the WEC title with a first-round finish of Antonio Banuelos at WC20 back in 2006. Mm-hmm. And dude has a tremendous work ethic, a good set of skills. And, dude, you got to rock that mustache. you got to love that mustache. <laughs> yeah. So, but, uh, yeah, congratulations to Eddie Weinland, and I'm I'm glad it's time. It's it's rough when these guys stick around a little bit too long. Mm-hmm. So, yep. Uh, there's guy. also something that was announced unofficially, but officially this weekend. So it seems like Usyk versus Joshua too is happening August 20th. Oh, let's talk about it. Because uh, Tyson Fury was also did a big interview mm-hmm. where he had some things to say as well. But first, let's talk about August 20th, Usyk Joshua announcement. Yeah. Usyk back out of the war, into training. Tyson Fury doesn't think he's got what it takes, Joshua, to beat Usyk. What do you I think? Either. I think he's... The thing with Joshua is, like, his style wants you... Once you broke it, I don't, I don't like that's the thing. It wasn't like the first fight was like when he lost to Ruiz and it was like, oh, flash knockout. Mm-hmm. It was like Usyk beat him down technically for. And Usyk was every moment of that a fight. premier champion prior to this in the weight class below, unified yeah. cruiserweight champion. It wasn't like Ruiz who just kind of came out of nowhere, mm-hmm. you know, highly touted. Like, like he was already an established, yeah. well known set of skills that clearly carried over into heavyweight. Mm-hmm. Whoops up on Joshua. And I agree. I think that Usyk retains his belts here, and Joshua is sent out into the pasture of decline. See, this would, this would be a perfect time if he were to lose to fight Deontay Wilder. Something Anthony like that. Joshua? Yeah. Yeah, that is the fight for him. Mm-hmm. I don't know what other fight Wilder would be interested in because he's not going to get the Usyk fight because what we were saying about Tyson Fury – I mean, he's saying it in outlandish ways, but he's making it known that he's maybe not as done as we thought. Mm-hmm. That for the right fight, he will fight again. And it's the WBC belt that he holds, I do believe, right? In the Ring Magazine, too. Yeah, in the Ring Magazine. But the WBC has come out and issued a statement that says that for now, his mandatory obligations are fulfilled for the next 12 months. So he's not going to face any decision, actually, for a year. That's a WBC play. Please Absolutely. don't. Please, please, please. Absolutely, <laughs> they're begging him not to retire. So they're being as accommodating as possible to keep him as their current champion. Yeah. And now we've got August here <coughs> with the winner clearly is going to want to fight Tyson Fury. It's the only fight for the winner. Yeah. I mean, I suppose if Joshua gets the victory here, there might be Probably some... Third. Third thing with Usyk, I, I just don't see that happening. I, I just, no. I would be shocked. It's all things are possible in boxing, but let's keep it real here. Yeah, for real. And I also think that Tyson Fury, it would, 
the aesthetics would be weird because you six small and Fury yeah. so huge, but he would I'm pretty sure he'd screw him up pretty bad. I think so and too. Unify the titles. Yeah. Uh, which would be amazing. It's what we've all been wanting. Mm-hmm. At least that fight. I mean, the only reason that we wanted the fight with Joshua was because Joshua held all the belts. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is, is now it just sets up so many different things because if he would have the whole thing with like uh, him getting a, I don't know what it's called, to like go back to train uh, from the You're Ukrainian government. from the military or whatever, yeah. yeah. Um. I feel like that was the whole thing that has like changed the landscape of what's going to happen now. You know, because I mean? before it was like Fury's like, well, they're tied up for a whole year. I'm just going to be done. You right. Know? Uh, but now that nothing's tied up and we have a date and all that, I wonder, I truly do wonder if that makes Tyson Fury want to stick around. Well, I think the indications are yes, because he says uh, on this recent interview, he's, it was like an hour long interview. He said, yes, he'll come back for the right opponent. And two for the right amount of money, which he claims right now is a half a billion dollars, five hundred million, which we all laugh and scoff at. Okay, but that's just him setting the bar really high and talking shit. I think the underlying yeah, the message here is, well, yeah, hundred million, the right opponent and the right payday. He'll be there. The right opponent's going to be whoever holds those other three belts and emerges victorious after this Usyk Joshua about him. I mean, if you can play, pay Floyd Mayweather hundred million dollars, I don't know why you can't pay. Tyson Fury. He just got a bare minimum of what was it, forty-two million to yeah. fight Dylan White. Yeah, and that does not include pay-per-view or possible gate money or anything mm-hmm. else. That was just his guaranteed. Tyson Fury is a show everywhere he goes, though. That's what I mean. Like at the yeah. end of the day, is you could pay that man. Doesn't it's matter. not that crazy He's priceless. to say he could get a hundred million. Yeah, no. Um, we've seen it happen in boxing before. I think he's the guy that could get that cash for this fight. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it's a lot more likely now, that what you just said, because this date and this fight is now set, it's not the uncertainty of war yeah. it's possible. Who knows when? Yeah. Fury's sticking around and fighting goddamn mandatories left and right he doesn't want to deal with. Mm-hmm. That's all changed. Absolutely. I think it happens. Me too. And Fury walks off into the sunset, undisputed champion. Yeah, he'll be the lineal undisputed champion once again, having regained everything that was stripped from him after the Klitschko bouts and his subsequent, yeah. you know, descent I mean, you into don't depression. Really, at that point, you didn't even have to put the lineal title on him. He's just the undisputed champ. He's he'll be the fucking. There is no know. better way to end his career. He knows it. Yeah. Oh yeah, hundred percent. He has to know it. There's no other way. And I mean, like, even if he wanted to define, like, even if he wanted to defend it too, I, I, I could see him. I don't see anybody giving him any issues. No. You know what I'm saying? Like, maybe becoming unified champion reignites the fire for him. It could. You know what I'm saying? Because that, that's going to be a historic night. Like, that's going to be a huge card. Whatever it does happen. And it, it's the perfect cap to a, a literal storybook career oh yeah i mean I, I know people that are fans know but not not everyone knows the complete story we won't go into details here but this is a man who was born into a fighting family i mean he's literally a fighting gypsy it was named after mike tyson he's named after mike tyson yeah. his father declares when he's born he's going to be the heavyweight champ of the world he grows into a giant of a man becomes the heavyweight champ then loses everything Nearly loses his mind, nearly kills himself, massively out of shape. Yeah. Stages this miraculous comeback right on in public view. Talks openly about his problems, defeats all his demons, comes back, never loses, wins the title back, and then to unify everything that he lost yeah. outside of the ring. It's an insane that sells fucking the billion story. Dollar movie. It, it is. Yeah. Just like Rocky, but even better. Yeah. It's the type of thing that it would be too much when you when you write it. Like yeah. when you you tell the movie, they're like, "Oh, you're gonna have him really. He's gonna be named after Mike Tyson, and he's gonna be the champ, and he's gonna lose it all, but then regain it. Really, like it's too much. <laughs> it's too much bullshit. Oh, that's well, yeah, no, that's, that's shit. Yeah. So, I'm really actually excited by that potential now, and it makes me way more interested in the Usyk Joshua match if than if Tyson really had retired and ridden off into the sunset, and that was. Dead in the water. 
<clears throat> but that's the thing. Even if he does, he's still, I'd say, shoot. I don't know, man. He, he like, 1A, 1B, like, greatest heavyweight of all time. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I'd say it's him and, him and Ali. Dana White couldn't be more wrong when he talks about boxing his dad. He's trying to run that story again. I think what we've seen just this year alone, how could you possibly say that? And I mean, yeah. look at the upcoming possibilities. We've got Crawford and Spence talking about really going yep. at it here. We've got unified champs at lightweight. We've and got there's so many great contenders still in that whole like lightweight bubble too. Everywhere, man. Yeah. Everywhere. We've got, you know, the future is wide open with Tank Davis possibly leaving fucking Mayweather. Maybe even going with Eddie Hearn, some of the fights he could put together. Yeah. We've got we could go on and on and on. Yeah. And to cap it all off with the possibility of a unified heavyweight champion again, no matter who that is, and maybe it being Tyson the, Fury. Yeah, the most entertaining boxer in the world. <clears throat> Amazing possibilities ahead. Yeah. Most definitely. I think that wraps the show for today, my friend. Yep. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We appreciate you. If you're brand new to the show, you can find us where all podcasts are distributed across all major platforms, and you can find video on YouTube and a bunch of other stuff we've put in one spot. SWATMMA.com, where you can head over there, click the gear button, and support the podcast. Or go to Instagram and follow us at SWATMMA Podcast. Peace. Peace.